We're going to continue in 1 John. And we've been, uh, been working our way through this little book in, in, uh, uh, in John's inspiration of the Holy Spirit to fight against the Gnostic heresies of his day. And uh, uh, one of the reasons I, I feel that, that the Lord kind of led me to preach to this book is, is that we're seeing many of the same things today. And, and really what it boils down to is, is a profession without a possession. Uh, people who, who claim that they know God, but when you look at their life, it's not a life of love. It's not a life of faith. It's not a life filled with the Holy Spirit. And uh, we, need to, we need to be able to recognize that. We need, first of all, to be able to recognize if that's happening in our own lives to make sure that we have a genuine walk with Jesus. And so uh, we're talking about evidence of salvation today. 1 John chapter 4, and we're going to begin reading in verse 12. I just want to read verse 12, talk about that for just a minute, then we'll pick up and, and read the rest. So verse 12, no man hath seen God at any time. Now, for some, some people, this is one of those places that they love to turn to, and they love to say, this is a contradiction in the Bible. Um, because it says here, no man has seen God at any time. Well, what about Moses? Well, what about this? What about that? So let's look at a few of those. Uh, turn with me, if you will, Exodus chapter 24. Exodus chapter 24, verse 9. It says, Then went up Moses and Aaron, Nadab and Abihu, and seventy of the elders of Israel. And they saw the God of Israel. Okay, so there's the Old Testament. It says that these 74 men saw the God of Israel. But John tells us no man has seen God at any time. So there you go. Now we have this, this discrepancy. We have this, uh, uh, well, it, it's, a, it's a contradiction in the Bible. That proves that, that the Bible is, is not true, that it has these problems, right? Well, Let's, uh, let's continue to read that. It says, They saw the God of Israel, there was a, and there was under his feet, as it were, a paved work of a sapphire stone, and as it were, the body of heaven in his clearness. Uh, now turn with me, if you will, to John chapter 1 and verse 18. John chapter 1 and verse 18. It says, No man has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, he hath declared him. Ah, so, so now we see John in his gospel and John in his epistle both saying something similar. That is, no man has seen God at any time. However, John in his, epistle, or his gospel goes on and says, The only begotten Son, which is the bosom of the Father, He hath declared Him. Right? And now one more. John chapter 4 and verse 24. John chapter 4 and verse 24 tells us, God is a spirit. And they that worship Him must worship Him in spirit and in truth. So what we find is, is we see that when people see God, they are not seeing the Father, they're seeing the Son. That means that Moses, Nadab, Abihu, and the 70 elders who went up on the mountain, they saw the pre-incarnate Christ. That means Jesus before He came in the flesh. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3. I'll continue to, to show you a few passages here. So, so the Father, is, he, is, he is spirit, and, and nobody has seen Him. But when somebody sees God, who they're seeing is Jesus. So Jesus is very much alive, very much active in the Old Testament. He doesn't have His beginning in Bethlehem. That's very, very important for us. His beginning, well, He has no beginning, all right? And he'll have no ending. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last, saith the Lord. Okay? So in Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 3, he says, Who, speaking of Jesus, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had made by him, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. And so, so Jesus is the brightness of the glory of God. He is the, the, the person of God that we can see. And John told us earlier, remember, we, we beheld him. We, we touched him. You know, the word of life in chapter 1 of 1 John, right? And then in John 14, 9, Jesus saith unto him, Have I been so long time with you, and yet hast thou not known me, Philip? He that seeth me hath seen the Father. 
And how sayest thou, show us the Father. So, so what John is helping us to understand when he says here that no man has seen God at any time, he is talking about the Father. And even in the Old Testament, when these men have this, this opportunity to go up on Mount Sinai and they see the God of Israel, they are looking at Jesus. They're seeing Jesus before he became a man here on this earth. All right, well, let's, let's go ahead and continue to read. John, 1 John chapter 4, verse 12. No man has seen God at any time. If we love one another, God dwelleth in us, and His love is perfected in us. Hereby know we that we dwell in Him and He in us, because He hath given us of His Spirit. And we have seen and do testify that the Father sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. Whosoever shall confess that Jesus is the Son of God, God dwelleth in Him and He in God. And we have known and believed the love that God hath to us. God is love. And he that dwelleth in love dwelleth in God and God in him. Herein is our love made perfect, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment. Because as he is, so are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casteth out fear, because fear hath torment. He that feareth is not made perfect in love. We love him because he first loved us. If a man say, I love God, and hateth his brother, he is a liar. For he that loveth not his brother whom he hath seen, how can he love God whom he hath not seen? And this commandment have we from him, that he who loved, loveth God love his brother also. All right, let's pray together. Heavenly Father, as we bow in your presence this morning, we are grateful. We thank you, Lord, for the word of God, for the opportunity we have to gather together to open the Bible and, Lord, just to hear what you have to say to us. Father, we believe you, and faith comes by hearing, not by seeing. We don't have to see you to know that you exist, but we have to hear your word. And so, God, I pray for ears to hear what your spirit has to say to us today. And we are we're just grateful, Lord, and we thank you for the opportunity we have in the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. And amen. Well, so so once again, uh, verse 13 there tells us, Hereby know we that we dwell in Him, and He in us, because He hath given us of His Spirit. One of the evidences of salvation is the existence of the presence of the Holy Spirit in the life of the believer. This is, this is a, 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 the down payment, or the earnest is the word the Bible uses to describe what God has done for us. He has promised us eternity. He has promised us uh, a, a, an eternal life, a home in heaven. He has promised us a, a complete new existence, a place where there's no more crying, no more tears, no more pain, no more COVID-19, no more none of that stuff. Uh, but, but we're not there yet. He's given us a down payment of that in the fact that He has sealed us with His Holy Spirit. So the first thing we want to look at this morning is the love of God is visible in our lives. People can't see God. This is why uh, idolatry is so prevalent all throughout the Old Testament. We see it anywhere in the world you want to travel, you can find it. Um, I grew up in New Mexico and there's idolatry all over the Native American cultures of New Mexico through the Kachinas and through, through uh, all of those kind of things. The, the idea that somehow a spirit can be represented in such a way that you can see it, touch it, go up to it, bow down to it, made out of wood or stone or clay or some precious metal, something. You go to India, they're everywhere. You go to Africa, there you'll find them. The Norse, they carved their, their Odin and their, their other gods and goddesses. All over the world, Egypt is covered up with it, right? But we can't see our God. This was one of the things that Titus was so... Uh, he just had to scratch his head whenever he finally sacked Jerusalem. And he kicked the doors down to the temple and went into the most holy place. And it was empty. And he was like... And so in the early centuries of the church, many times Jews and Christians were accused by Romans of being atheists. Because they couldn't imagine a group of people who worshipped a God or a goddess that they didn't represent in some way, right? And yet God has told us, He told us in the Ten Commandments, He's told us all throughout the Scripture, I am not worshipped through an image made by man's hands. 
Our God is a spirit. So how then do people see God? And that's what John is getting at here. How can people see God? The love of God is visible in our lives. Look what he says there in verse 12. If we love one another, the love that we have for one another, he says, God dwelleth in us. We find this love coming from us because God dwells in us. And his love is perfected in us. Hereby know we that we dwell in him and he in us because he has given us of his spirit. God literally dwells in the Christian. Literally. His spirit moves into us. And, and so what we find is, is, he says there, God is love. I like, to, I like to take 1 John and Galatians and put them together in my mind to try to help myself understand this. If the one who is love lives in me, then what should the fruit of my life be? It should be love, shouldn't it? And so, so that's where love comes from. It comes from God. Not that we love God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sins. And so, so when, when we are, are, are truly born again, when we truly belong to God, God moves into us by His Spirit, and then love can come forth out of us. And that's how people see the love of God. Verse 20 tells us this. If a man say, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. I mean, it's just as plain as that. You can't say you love God and be filled with hate. It's a contradiction of terms, okay? So, so I like to think about it like the cross. If you'll, if you'll imagine for a second the cross... The cross has two beams to it. It has the vertical and it has the horizontal. I like to think of the vertical part of the cross being like a tether between me and God. It ties us together, this part. This is my relationship with God. It ties me together because of His love. And then I like to think of the horizontal beam of the cross reminding me of the horizontal love that I'm to have for the people that are around me. I'm to love my neighbor, I'm to love my enemy, I'm to love my brothers and sisters in Christ, I'm to love my wife. I, that, I can't find anybody that I'm not supposed to love whenever I read the Bible. And, and if you'll remember that, that this is what Jesus did for us. As he went to the cross, he enabled us to receive the love of God, and then once we receive the love of God, we can return that love to God. And he enabled us to receive the love of God that we can spread around us. And, and it's important that we love our brothers. Jesus has given us this commandment. Verse 21, this is the commandment have we from him, that he who loveth God love his brother also. That's the commandment. And, and it's absolutely essential. John 13, 34 and 35, a new commandment I give unto you, that ye love one another. Now. That doesn't seem like a new commandment. I know we already talked about this earlier, but this is so important. Why is it a new commandment that we love one another in John 13? I could take you to Leviticus and show you that the Bible says, I'm to love my neighbor as myself. Well, the new commandment is because of, is it a prepositional phrase? As? As. A prepositional phrase is what makes this a new commandment. <laughs> Y'all just thought it was summer. You get a little English whipped on you this morning. As... I have loved you, that ye also love one another. That's the new commandment. That's what makes it new. That's what intensifies it. I mean, think about it. How has Jesus loved us? Oh my goodness, he gave his life for us. And, and so, so the old commandment was love your neighbor as yourself, right? Well, some people don't even love themselves. They hate themselves. And so, you know, they can excuse themselves in all kinds of ways with that. But when you look at Jesus and he says, I want you to love your neighbor as I loved you. Oh, well, now he just he just entered into the realm of impossible. And that's why it takes his spirit within us to carry this out. It's a supernatural life. He's called us to. By this shall all men know that you are my disciples if you have love one to another. He has given us his spirit. Galatians 5, 22. The fruit of the spirit is love. Joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. And so, so this, is, this is what we see. The, the love of God is visible in our lives. People can't see God 
but they can see the love of God visible in the lives of his people. Number two, the love of God is audible in our lives. Look at verse 14. And we have seen and do testify. We have seen and do testify. You know, there's a lot of people who talk about lifestyle evangelism, and I totally agree with lifestyle evangelism right up to the point where it's not audible. People say, when we love people, when we live a good life, when we do good deeds, and we do our good deeds before men, that they might see our good deeds and glorify the Father who is in heaven, which is what Matthew chapter 5 specifically tells us to do. Amen. Praise the Lord. I agree with all of that. But if the love of God in our lives doesn't become audible at some point, then we're not fully carrying through. Because he tells us there in verse 14, we have seen and do testify. So not only is it this lifestyle that we live, this love that we show, but it's also the testimony or the witness that we give of the Lord Jesus Christ. He says, we do testify that the Father sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. Whosoever shall confess that Jesus is the Son of God, God dwelleth in him, and he in God. We have seen and do testify, he says. Witness that God the Father sent the Son to be the Savior. Acts chapter 1, verse 8. Magnificent passage of Scripture. <clears throat> the Lord tells his disciples, But ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. What's the power for? And ye shall be witnesses. Witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. He says, Whosoever shall confess that Jesus is the Son of God, God dwelleth in him and he in God. What does it mean to confess? What does that mean? Well, the Greek word is homo logeo, and it means to speak the same. It means to speak the same. So in 1 John 1, 9, when it says, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins, and he cleanses us of all unrighteousness. That is the same word, and it means to speak the same. So, so when I confess my sins, what I say is, is I say, Lord... Your word says, this is sin, I'm speaking the same. I sin. This is wrong, I did wrong, I'm saying, I agree with you, I'm speaking the same thing you do. Here, it's not talking about confessing our sins, it's talking about the confession that we're speaking the same thing about Jesus that God says about Jesus. So can you see there, he says, whosoever shall confess or speak the same as God, that Jesus is the Son of God, God dwelleth in him, and he in God. So Jesus tells us in Matthew chapter 10, at verse 32, Whosoever therefore shall confess me before men, him will I confess also before my Father which is in heaven. But whosoever shall deny me before men, him will I also deny before my Father who is in heaven. And so, so we are called to not only live a visible life of love, and through our loving one another, and through our love shown to other people, people can see the love of God in us, and see that we are the disciples of Jesus. We're also called to audibly confess that Jesus is the Son of God. It's absolutely imperative that when we have opportunity, that we speak up for Jesus, that we that we share the good news excuse me, the good news of Jesus Christ, that we share the message of the cross. And, and he tells us there, he says that if we'll confess him before men, he'll confess us before our Father in heaven. And don't make that into a work. Uh, I, I've, I've heard entire messages that basically say, if you haven't led somebody else to Jesus, you're not saved yourself. That's not the point. The, the point is, is that if you truly belong to Jesus, you're going to want to speak up for him whenever you have the opportunity. It's interesting, the Greek word for witness is martyr. It's where we get the word martyr from. And if you were to look at the history of the church age, you would find that there have been an awful lot of people that wicked and evil men, wicked and evil governments have slaughtered because they came down to it and they said, you gotta choose. Either say, Caesar is Lord, or tell me who your Lord is. And they would stand and they would say, Christos Kyrios. Jesus is Lord. And the Romans butchered them for it during periods of time in the Roman world. 
Not only them, but the communists have butchered people for years and years and years who claim that Jesus was Lord. I had a friend of mine, a, a Mexican pastor. Uh, he was from, uh, lived in Juarez. He was uh, going with another group of pastors to Cuba. And at the time, we had an embargo on Cuba, and Americans couldn't travel to Cuba. And, and he invited me to go with him. I said, well, I, I can't. He said, well, if you'll come to Mexico, you can... Hey, you can go from Mexico to Cuba with us. And I almost did it. I, I just didn't feel like I wanted to, but I didn't feel like God was leading me in that direction, so I didn't go. Anyway, this group of Mexican pastors and evangelists went to Cuba to preach. When they got to Cuba, this was during the big time Castro days. When they got to Cuba, they set them all down. They said, we're glad to have you in our country. We're, we're glad to have you speaking in some of our churches. But here's the deal. There are a few things that you can't talk about. You can't say one word about Castro. You can't say one word about the government. You can't say one word about this, this. They gave them a list of things. But one of the things that they said that they could not speak on or preach on was any kingdom. Don't talk about any kingdom at all. Isn't that funny that the communists were so scared of proclaiming the kingdom a different kingdom? They, they want to set up a man as their God. And, and so, so the, the, the fact that we audibly witness for Jesus, this is one of the ways that people can find out and see and understand the love of God. Can't see God, God, God as much as I wanted to. You know, haven't you ever thought about this? Haven't you ever wondered, God, why don't you just, just roll the heavens back and just say, hey, I'm God. I created this world. Repent. What? Wouldn't you? I, yeah, I don't know. You guys, I don't know if you think about it. I do. I'm like, God, all you got to do is just thump him in the head, right? He thumps me in the head sometimes, and I need it every single time he does it. Why doesn't God do that? Well, <clears throat> that's not how he's chosen to carry out his kingdom, his ministry, and, and, and to announce the presence of his son and his sovereignty, he has called us. And he wants to do it through us. And so when we love, people can see the love of God through us. When we testify, people can hear the love of God through us. We know and believe that the love that God has for us because God is love. Look at verse 16. And we have known and believed the love that God hath to us. God is love. When you truly meet God for the first time in your life, you actually realize what real, true love really is. Now, there are some things that come very, very close on this earth. And if you have a Christian mommy and daddy, that's probably the first place that you ever witness the love of God because they're doing exactly what John is telling us to do here. They are loving you and showing you the love of God through that love. They are testifying to you, telling you about the love of God. But then whenever you receive the love of God for yourself, all of a sudden you go, wow, God is love. This is what true love really is. Number three, the love of God is tangible in our lives. It is visible, it is audible, and it is tangible. What does tangible mean? It means something that you can touch. It means that it's real and not imaginary. Do you remember? It's been it's been a while now. It may have been 20 years ago. Old Jesse, the body of Ventura, he said that Christians were weak and they needed a crutch. And that God was their crutch. They had imagined a God. They had imagined this, this, this big uh, uh, God up there, out there somewhere. And they, 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 they needed this crutch to get along. Well... Here's the thing. This book that we're studying this morning is not like any other book. This is not a storybook. This is not like Aesop's fables. This is not a book of mythology. Uh, it's not even some good suggestions. This book is the truth. It is the Word of God. It doesn't contain the Word of God. It is the Word of God. And it describes for us the love of a God who is very real. And, and so this is not something to pacify your conscience or some psychological crutch to try to help you cope with life. God is real. He is not imaginary. And so when you and I 
take the love of God that's real in our lives and we make it real into the lives of other people, it becomes tangible. It becomes something that you can touch. And so, so what we see there, look at verse 17. Herein is our love made perfect. Okay? So, so the word perfect means something that's complete. So we receive this love from God. Here's how it's made complete. That we may have boldness in the day of judgment. Because as He is, so are we in this world. Man, what a statement. Boldness in the day of judgment. Can you imagine? I want you just to imagine with me for just a moment. There have been a lot of people who have sang about this, but one of my favorites is, uh, is Third Day and, and the song that they sing. And he, he says, Max says it's something like this. Let me think. I, I didn't write this down, so I have to think about it for a minute. It's basically a question. What are you going to say on the judgment day when you stand before the throne? What are you going to say? How are you going to explain your life? You know, there are lots of people, and, and this is a good way to start a conversation about Jesus, by the way, is to ask them, someday when you stand before God, what will you say? And then back with that old raspy voice, I trust in Jesus, right? I'm not going to say anything about me. I'm not going to talk about what I've done. I'm not going to talk about the good deeds that I've done. I'm not going to talk about how great I've been. I'm not going to talk about how I, 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 I have these, these uh, accomplishments and these achievements. I'm going to hide behind Jesus. <laughs> but it's going to give me boldness before the throne. You know where that boldness comes from? It doesn't come from me. It comes from the fact that I know that He paid for my sin. And I know that He has given me eternal life. And that is... He loves me, and that is going to allow me to stand boldly before that throne. It allows me right now, according to Hebrews, to go boldly to the throne of grace in prayer. Right? Not because of me. God, I've been so good today, I actually deserve access into your presence. No, of course not. Of course not. Of course not. But I can boldly go there because Jesus, because of what he's done. And so, so look what he says there in verse 17. He says, herein is our love made perfect that we may have boldness in the day of judgment because as he is, so are we in this world. That is just an incredible statement. As he is, so are we in this world. That is a positional statement. It has to be because there's no way that we can compare ourselves to Jesus now or to say that we have arrived in some way. This is a statement that God says, this is true of you. You are in this world as Jesus is in this world. In other words, His Holy Spirit in you is motivating you to live this righteous life, to allow the love of God to flow through you in the world in a real and tangible way. This is why anytime you have an opportunity to do a good deed and someone says something about it, Always take the opportunity to give God the glory because He's the one who is doing this in you and through you. Matthew chapter 10 and verse 25. As He is, with that in the back of our minds, as He is, so are we in this world. Matthew chapter 10 and verse 25. It is enough for the disciple that he be as his master. See, this is a, this is a, a, a master and disciple kind of a, of a statement that he's making here. When our love is made perfect, what that means is, is that we are following Jesus. And He is perfecting His love in us. And that love is flowing out of us. So He says, it's enough for the disciple that he be as his master and the servant as his Lord. If they have called the master of the house Beelzebub, how much more shall they call them of his household? So, as Jesus was in this world, as He suffered persecution and misunderstanding and was basically called Satan, so are we going to be. As the world hated him, so are we going to be. Okay, And that's just part of it. Uh, he promised us that was going to happen. I don't like it. I don't know anybody who likes to be hated, but the world is going to hate the believer. And boy, oh boy, can you not see it? Aren't they turning the heat up right now? Man, I tell you what, it, it's pretty amazing what's going on. John 15, verse 20. John, the Gospel, chapter 15, verse 20. Remember the word that I said unto you, the servant is not greater than his Lord. If they have persecuted me, 
they will also persecute you. If they have kept my saying, they will keep yours also. Isn't that interesting? Whether people receive Jesus' saying or not, whether he had been there, if Jesus himself, you've got to always remember this. Anytime you try to share the gospel, you've got to always remember this. Even if Jesus himself had been standing there sharing the message of that person, they still might have rejected the Lord himself with the, the, with the nail prints in his hands, pleading for them to trust him. But they still would have rejected him. If they reject you, they're rejecting the, your words. If they're, if they're word, the words from this book, they're rejecting the Lord. 1 John chapter 2, verse 6. 1 John chapter 2, verse 6. He that saith he abideth in him on himself also, so to walk, even as he walked. And this is this is our, our walk in this world, our lifestyle in this world, our behavior in this world. We are to allow the Lord Jesus to change our lives in every way, shape, and form and fashion. It's important that we live a life of following Jesus as we go through this world. And then he goes on to say there is no fear in love. We do not have to fear standing before Christ. Why? Because He loves us. And we live a life of His love. That, that's just amazing to me. I don't know about you, but I think about it sometimes. I'll, uh, I'll be driving or maybe I'll be laying in bed at night before I go to sleep and I'll just be thinking about what it's going to be like. I'll go read Revelation 4 and 5. Or I'll read Isaiah. Uh, we're, we're in chapter 6, I believe, where he's, he's, he's in the throne room of heaven. And I'll just imagine the smoke billowing out of that thing and the, and the, and the whole building shaking at the sound of his voice and the rushing of many waters. And I mean, it makes my, my, the hair stand up on the back of my neck and it makes my blood pressure rise just to think about it. I mean, it, it's terrifying. It gives me goose pimples just to think about it. Can you imagine what it's going to be like to stand before Almighty God? Well, when John, when it happened to him, he fell at his feet as dead. Boom! When Isaiah, when it happened to him, he said, Woe is me, I'm undone, for I'm a man of unclean lips, I live in the midst of a people of unclean lips. I mean, these men were terrified. And it wasn't until the seraph went, took the coal, touched it to his lips, and says, It's all right, you, we're taking care of you now, you can... You can listen to what God has to say to you. Same thing with John. One of the elders had to come to help him up. It's all right. But for you and I, we can have boldness on that day. We don't have to have fear on that day. Why? Because Jesus has paid for our sins. We're not going to stand before God on our own. We're going to stand before God bathed, washed in the blood of Jesus Christ. And it's the only way. It's the only way that any man, any woman, any boy, any girl will ever be acceptable in his sight is to be washed in the blood. There is no other way. And so, so he says there, he says, there's no fear in love, but perfect love casteth out fear. See, this is where John is getting us to. For, for John, for the Christian, we are to be the, the, the people of love. And when we receive the Holy Spirit, if God is love, then that means that love's going to flow through our life and God is going to bring us to a place of completion. It's not going to happen fully in this life, but He's working on us. It's called sanctification. It's, it's where God is chipping off all of Roddy and He's getting me closer and closer and closer and closer to looking more like Jesus. That's what He wants. That's our destiny. According to Romans chapter 8, our destiny is is to be conformed to the image of Christ. That's our destiny. That's where we're headed. That's what we have to look forward to. And someday, when we're glorified, that will be made absolutely complete. Until then, there's a war going on. There's a war going on inside of me, between my flesh and the Spirit of God, that's dragging me back and forth like this, that I have to fight every day, and that I have to have victory over every day by faith. But he says there, he says, Christ has already paid for our sins on the cross. Right? He says, he says, no fear in love because fear hath torment. He that feareth is not made perfect in love. We love him because he first loved us. And, and so, so in Romans chapter 8 and verse 1, the Bible says, There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. There's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. You know what that does for you? Here's, here's the way religious people live their lives, okay? If you ask a religious person, 
do you know for sure if you were to die today that you would go to heaven? They say, I hope so. I hope so. I hope that I've done enough. I hope that I've asked enough forgiveness. I hope I've confessed all of my sins. I hope that my good deeds are enough to get me in, but I'm not sure. And so they always live with a sense of fear. Just a little bit of fear in their lives, or maybe a whole bunch of fear. And it's always based on how well you're doing at the time. So you have one day and you're doing great. Man, I did so good today. I got up this morning, I prayed. I, I had a, an impure thought and I took control of that thing immediately and I confessed it to the Lord. And, and then I wanted to say something ugly to my brother, but, but I didn't do it. I held my tongue and I quenched the fires of hell that reside in my mouth. I, you know, and, and you get to the end of the day and you're like, man, I, got, I just strode into heaven today. I did so good. And then the next day, well, you hit your finger with a hammer and you say something that you ought not have said and you're like, boy, what a terrible start to this day. Now, I'm, you know, today, now I need, I, now, now I'm in trouble. Boy, I, if, if God comes today, see, that's religion. That's you trying to do enough good deeds to be right with Him. You know what? This book does not teach us that God wants our religion. This book says that there is a relationship with Jesus Christ in which we can know for sure that we are saved, know for sure that we will not be condemned, have a boldness to enter into His presence in prayer now, have a boldness to stand before the throne someday when it's our time, and to absolutely know for sure that we are accepted by God right now. And you know what that does? It just takes all the pressure off. It's just, whew, I'm free. Now I'm free. I'm not trying to get in. I know I'm in. What I can do now is I can learn the lessons that He has for me. When I blow it, is it the end of the world? No. I go to Him. I confess. I receive His cleansing and His forgiveness. And I go on and I, and I get after it again. Does He know I'm going to blow it? Yes. Does He want me to blow it? No. But, but He loves me. And because I know He loves me, I don't have to be afraid of Him anymore. He's now my friend. And so I have this perfect peace in, in His presence. He says there, and this is the command, the, and this commandment have we from Him, that he who loveth God love his brother also. Why? Because He first loved us. Um, Isabel and I were having a little bit of a, of a discussion this week, and we were talking about something called prevenient grace. <clears throat> I really, I, I had confessed to her, I, I I, I sort of know what that is because I have read some old books. But to, to be real honest, I, I, don't, I don't really study those kinds of things really, really hard. But basically what prevenient grace means is that God is the first mover in the relationship with us. And that's exactly what 1 John chapter 4 tells us. We love Him because He first loved us. Not that we love God, but that He loved us and gave His Son to be our Savior, to be the propitiation for our sins. So God is the first mover. And so, so when, when the love of God becomes tangible in our lives, here's how it works. I'm going through life, maybe I am a religious person who has thoughts about God, and maybe I'm not. Maybe I have some kind of church background and maybe I don't. Doesn't make any difference. I'm going through life and I'm either trusting in some deity or in myself, one or the other. So the people who trust themselves, you know, I mean, I mean, a, a pure dematerialist atheist is trusting in themselves and their ability to think, to say there's nothing beyond this life. I trust that. I, I trust science rather than God, whatever, whatever they're saying. They're trusting in themselves and their ability to read every book that's ever been written in the history of the world because now they have all knowledge because they know absolutely for sure that there is no God. And some of them are just that arrogant. But whatever, that's what they're trusting. There are other people who are religious and they're trusting in some little carved statue that their mom and dad have sitting on the shelf or in some, you know, the fact that we were hatched from uh, a flying eagle and reside upon the back of a giant turtle. And, you know, I mean, there's people who, who believe those kind of things, and they are really secure in that belief. And then all of a sudden, one day, all of a sudden, we start thinking, you know what? The whole giant turtle thing really doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me. What about all those people on the belly of the turtle, you know? 
uh, if the world really is round. Now, I know there's flat earthers out there, but we're not talking about them right now. But you see, my point is, is, is at some point, somebody starts to question these things. Maybe it's because they hear somebody share the gospel of Jesus with them. Maybe it's because they read a book. Maybe it's because they're just sitting out there one day uh, contemplating a tree and how intricate that thing is. And they go, you know, that really couldn't have happened by accident. It looks to me like somebody designed that. I wonder who that somebody is. The other thing that happens is, is your conscience. At some point in time, you're going to violate your conscience. And when you do that, you're going to realize there's right and there's wrong. Even these folks that are, that are tearing our country apart right now, they have a sense of right and wrong. It's very warped, but they still think that certain things are right and certain things are wrong. Where does that come from? It comes from a conscience. And so what the Bible tells us is, is that God has used the creation and the conscience to allow people to, to, to think transcendently, beyond themselves. And once a person begins to do that, at some point in time, once they hear the gospel, they're going to have this opportunity to hear that and to, and to, to think about it. Now, we, when that happens, when it happens in all of our lives, the thing that, that John is telling us, the thing we need to realize is, is we did not decide to go find God and go search for Him, love Him, until He loved me back. That's not what happened. What happened was, whether you realize it or not, is the great, as C.H. Spurgeon called him, the hound of heaven pursued you. He hunted you down. He loves you. And he came pursuing you. John chapter 4 says the Father is spirit. And he looks, he searches for worshipers who worship him in spirit and truth. He is hunting. He is looking. Just like Jesus come walking through this, this town filled with people, all these crowds around to see who he is. And he stops and he goes and talks to the one little man who climbed up in the tree. Now why did that little guy climb in the tree? He wanted to get a better look at Jesus. But that day his life changed. Was it that Zacchaeus decided to go hunting for Jesus? No. Zacchaeus found that God loved him first. And that's what John is telling us. So if you belong to Christ, in, in summary, here's the three things that will happen. Number one, you will love others. Number two, you will love others enough to witness to them of the Savior. And number three, when you love God, you will not be afraid of judgment any longer. These things perfect the love of God in our lives. Now, don't get me wrong. There is a, a judgment seat of Christ that we'll have to stand before, and we should have a reverence for God, a fear of God. We should fear God more than we fear man and more than we fear the things of this world. But, but what we're talking about, I believe what John's talking about here is a terror of God, a, a, a terror to, that, to be scared to approach to God. When, when you realize the love of God... It's just like the prodigal returning home. What you'll find is, is that he's running towards you, wanting you to fall into his arms and to embrace his long-lost son, his long-lost daughter. God is pursuing after us. These things perfect the love of God in our lives. I just want to encourage you today. You know, we live in such a messed up world right now. Um, what you're what you're seeing take place in our nation right now is 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 based on thesis and antithesis is called dialectic, and it is by design. It is a design. It is a psychological mechanism that's been used throughout history to just cause division. It doesn't matter what the division is. Just make everybody pick a side on everything that comes along. It doesn't matter what the, the situation is. It's been going on for a long time, but man, oh man, has the gas been turned up here within the last few months within our nation. <clears throat> there are Gnostics on both sides of everything that we're seeing take place. There are people who are justifying their, their position based on some warped idea of God on both sides. I want for you to be able to see through it. Don't play the game. That's one of the ways that we win in this situation. It's one of the ways that we have victory. Don't play. Recognize it for what it is. Recognize that most of the things in life 
aren't really as simple as just two sides, for one thing. Also recognize that you can disagree with somebody without hating them. You see, that's what's really happening right now in our country is this disagreement that's coming that, you know, I mean, I mean, you and I, we, we can be, we can decide, hey, I, I like red. Well, I don't like red, I like blue. And that'd be okay. And we've got to realize that. We've got, and I like red just fine. Point at, at Victoria, she's wearing red or orange or kind of red something. Red. I like it. I like your t-shirt. It's great. And Chloe's got on blue and it's great too. I like them both. I don't hate either one of you because of what you're wearing. You see, you see what it does to us? It just, it's happening right now in me. I, it's not all just kidding, but. The, the love of God in our lives helps us to see through the schemes. We are wise to the schemes of Satan. We're wise to it. We see it. He's at, he's at work. There's a war. He's trying to get us to fight with each other. He's trying to get us to hate each other. What do we have to do? See through it and love one another. I can disagree with somebody and love them. I, I, can, I can prosecute somebody who has broken the law and levy the full weight of the law against them and still love them. And we as Christians are the ones who have to lead the way in regards to that. And so I just want to encourage you in these days, don't get caught up in it. Don't get caught up in, in, the, in the hate game because that is really what's trying to, you know, just get them to hate each other enough and they'll tear themselves apart, which is exactly what Galatians says. Is be careful. Be, look, matter of fact, let's read it. Let's read it so I don't, I don't misquote it. Galatians chapter 5, verse 15. It, uh, look at verse 14. For all the law is fulfilled in one word, even in this, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Isn't that great? The, the whole law is just summed up right there. Verse 15. But if ye bite and devour one another, take heed that ye be not consumed one of another. You bite and devour after a little while. Every time you take a bite out of one another, here's a bite, there's a bite, here's a bite, there's a bite. When you get done, there's nothing left. You ever do that? Somebody makes something real good, have it sitting on the counter, and you come by and you just get one little bite. You come by after a little while and you get one little bite. You come by there a little while and somebody else has gotten one little bite. And there's a little bite there. Nobody's actually served up a dish yet. It's just a bite here and a bite there. And the next thing you know, you walk by there and the whole thing's gone. Well, that's what the apostles warning the church is warning you and I that this can happen. It's taking place right now in our nation. It's taking place, sometimes it's taking place within a family. Don't let it happen. Don't bite and devour each other. Recognize what's going on. We're called to love. And, and when we love, we are showing the love of God visibly, audibly, and tangibly in our lives. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we just come to you today in the name of Jesus, and we are grateful. Father, thank you for the Word of God. Thank you for the love of God. Thank you, Lord, that you have shed your love abroad upon us abundantly. God, we ask you to give us grace in these days. We ask for you to give us wisdom. And, and Lord, just, just help us to set our affection on things above, not on the things of this earth so that we can allow the love of God to flow out of our lives to those that are around us. Lord, people can't see you, but they can witness the love that we have that comes from you. They can hear about the love that comes from you as we share it with them. And Lord, whenever we become tangible in our love, they can truly experience your love in their lives. Father, thank you for this time. We just give you this time right now, and we ask you to do a work of grace in our hearts. We give you this time, and we ask you to search our hearts, and uh, just prepare us, Lord, just to share in the Lord's table. Uh, I'm going to ask you, if you would, just to take a moment and talk to the Lord right now, and then we'll share in the Lord's table together.